This is CBJ in 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union. Find out more and open an account online at telhio.org. Now here's your host, Bob McGilligan. It is finally time, finally time for the Blue Jackets to get on the ice and play their first meaningful game since they were eliminated in the second round of last year's playoffs. Tonight, they will take on the Toronto Maple Leafs at Nationwide Arena in Game 1 of the 82-game regular season that is 2019-2020. Welcome to CBJ and 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union. I'm Bob McElligot. Yes, we've been waiting for this ever since the Boston Bruins eliminated the Blue Jackets in the spring. It seems like a long time ago, and then it seems like only yesterday at the same time. But as we've talked about really ever since that elimination game and talked about all summer, talked about throughout training camp, this is a different Blue Jackets team. Oh, it looks the same in many regards, but it is a different team. And there are key positions where there will be different faces and different personnel. And before we get into all of that, and before I get to my guest, Elliot Friedman, who is one of the premier NHL insiders in the game, he, he knows everything about everything. And if you don't believe it, just ask him. But he also lives in Toronto. He works at Rogers Sportsnet. He's got just his finger on the pulse of the Toronto Maple Leafs and what's going on with the team the Blue Jackets are playing tonight. So I'm going to talk with Elliot Friedman about the Leafs, about the Blue Jackets, uh, his 31 Thoughts podcast that he does with Jeff Merrick. They had uh, some good conversation on the last episode about the Blue Jackets and what they think is going to happen in the Metropolitan Division, all of that. So I'll talk with Elliot about that here in just a few minutes. But first, I want to talk to you about Telhio Credit Union and how they have so many services. And there are so many things that they do that you don't even think about. Like a checking account is a checking account, right? I mean, you put your money in the bank, you get checks, and you write a check. Okay, if you're my age, you do that. Maybe if you are a little bit younger, you put your money in the bank. Even if you get checks, they sit in a drawer, you never use them. You get a check card, and that's the way you get your money. But listen, at Telhio Credit Union, they have checking accounts with perks and different bonuses and different things that you can get as part of your checking account. It's not just like, give me your money, I'm going to give you these checks, and we'll go from there. Oh, no, no, no. It is full service, and there are different benefits, and that's why you have to check it out. You have to check it out for yourself, and you can do it very easily. You can do it right now. You can go on your phone. You can go on your computer. You can type in tellhio.org. And you can find out what they have in the way of checking accounts, savings accounts, not just for you as an individual, but maybe you have a small business. They can help you out with all of that, too. It is all there on their easy-to-navigate website, so check it out. And if you don't want to do it that way, just stop by any local Telhio office. You find them all around town. You can do a search on the Internet. You can find out where the closest office to you is, and you can stop by and actually speak to a person. Telhio is open to everyone in central and southwestern Ohio. They are an equal housing lender, federally insured by NCUA. So the Blue Jackets tonight will have a bit of a different look. Oh, yes, they will have many of the same faces. Nick Foligno is still the captain. Cam Atkinson is still a prolific goal scorer. He'll be on the top line. Seth Jones will still be not only the top defenseman on this team, but probably the best in the National Hockey League this year, I think. So many of the cast of characters returns. But there is a big change. The biggest change, as I've talked to you about for weeks on end, is in goal. And Jonas Corposalo is going to get the opportunity to take over the job that he has had, well, he's had it in glimpses, I guess I could kind of say it that way, is, uh, you know, he had it, he'd get to play one time every three weeks as a backup goaltender. He'd get a chance to play stretches if there was an injury that's what he did the past three years but now this is his chance this is his opportunity to take this job and make it tough for somebody to take it away Elvis Merzlikens is the guy that wants to take it away is he ready to do that yet from what we saw in training camp for the bulk of training camp it doesn't look as though he's ready but that doesn't mean he can't be ready at the drop of a hat because the games are now real. And Elvis has spent a lot of time working on the angles and working on the shots from everywhere and working on the traffic in front of him. He spent his time doing that. 
and he played the preseason games, and some of them he struggled. In the last one he played, he looked really good. But now this is all for real. So I would expect he is going to up his level of competition. But the question is, will Jonas Corposalo give him the opportunity to do that? Or will Corposalo step in and will he just solidify himself very early on? He'll have that opportunity starting tonight. I don't think there's any question about that. And he's going to have to do it against a very talented offensive team. Very talented offensive team. Austin Matthews coming off a two-goal performance a couple of nights ago in the Leafs' opening night win over Ottawa. You've got John Tavares, the newly named captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs, who can find the back of the net, uh, well, with his eyes closed, pretty much. You've got William Nylander, who last year missed training camp, and he missed a couple of, uh, what, months of the season before he got his contract all worked out. He is ready to go this year. And you've got Mitch Marner, who was the premier restricted free agent this summer. As a matter of fact, uh, there were reports that the Blue Jackets were looking into a possible offer sheet. That didn't work out. He stayed in Toronto. He's back with the Leafs, and he will do damage. So for Corpus Allo, his work will be cut out for him. But he's going to have five guys in front of him, not at all times. I hope at all times, but sometimes maybe only four. But anyway, he's going to have teammates out there with him, and their job is going to be to adjust the structure of their team and the way that they play and help him as much as they possibly can. And the other way they can help him, oh, by the way, is scoring goals. And it all goes back to the two things that people have fretted over ever since the last game last year. And I think there are two camps. One camp is, will they be able to score enough? The other camp is, will they be able to keep the puck out of the net? And actually, I think there are some people that are in both camps. They just go back and forth between the two. But we're going to find out some of the answers starting tonight. And there are many questions and many answers. And we've got months to figure it all out. But the first answers start tonight. It looks like the fourth line is going to consist of Riley Nash playing with Emil Bemstrom and Jacob Lilia. Looks like Sonny Milano might be the guy out, uh, the odd man out here tonight. But don't forget, Lilia and Bemstrom played together in Europe. Uh, they played on the same team last year. They're very familiar with one another. I'm excited to see what the potential of that line is. I know what the potential is. I want to see if they live up to their potential. And again, one game does not a season make. But as I said, Questions start to be answered tonight at 7 o'clock. But right now, I'm going to bring in Elliot Friedman from Rogers Sportsnet in Canada. He also writes the 31 Thoughts column, and he has the 31 Thoughts podcast. It's a great podcast. Check it out on whatever podcast provider that you use. Elliot does it with Jeff Merrick, and right now he joins me. I was listening to your latest episode of the 31 Thoughts podcast, and you said something that I've been saying and I don't, I'm not just saying this because I work here. I truly believe it, and that's why I was glad to hear you say the same thing, that the Blue Jackets, you don't think the Blue Jackets are going to be as bad as some people think that they are. I think there's good structure here. I know that you, um, when you talk about it, you talked about John Tortorella and the accountability and that, uh, you know, they play for a, a tough coach, so they'll have that structure. My only question is, and this is this is my personal worry, there are some people who are here, here that are worried about where the goal is going to come from, and even though that's legit, I look at the goaltending, and that's where my biggest concern is. Can either one of these young guys uh, grab the job and do the job even close to the way it's been done here for the past seven years? What do you think about that? I think that's totally true. I think that that's. I, I think when it, when people look at your team and they say they're not going to be as good, they talk more about the goaltending than they do about the scoring. Hundred percent. What do you think? Do you have any opinions? I mean, Corpusalo has been here three years as a backup. Uh, there's were limited times where he had to jump in and play. And Merzlikens, even though he's been great in world competition, he's never played on an NHL ice surface in an NHL game. Well, well I remember Bobrovsky when her, he first came to Philly. The goalie coach in Philadelphia was Jeffries. And Jeffries told me, because I did a game there, and I said, how good is this guy? And he said, he's really good. He is going to be a great goalie. He said, the problem is that when you come over from Europe, to the National Hockey League, there are two things that you have to get used to. One, the players shoot more than they pass, 
And number two, the traffic. Like, they come right at you. It doesn't happen in the, in the KHL or anywhere in Europe. And he says once Bobrovsky gets used to the different style of play and the amount of people that are going to be in his face, he said he will, and then he will be a great goalie. And Philly ran out of patience. They, they made the trade before he was ready. But nobody needs to tell you guys in Columbus that Jeffries uh, was 100% correct, that once Bobrovsky got used to the NHL in a different way he was, it was playing, uh, he was outstanding. He was a top-of-the-line Vesna goaltender. So, and, and you know, I, I do agree with that. I, I think when you're looking at the future of your net in Columbus, they look at uh, Corpus Allo and they say, okay, we kind of know what he is. Now, maybe he'll surprise us. Hopefully he does. But generally, people think they have a good feel on who he is. Elvis, your other guy, that's the guy people predict has the bigger ceiling that when he does get used to it and when he does figure it out, he has a chance to be a real elite talent. So I think what we're all waiting for to figure out is how long is this learning curve? And I don't know if there's a set answer for that. I think you just have to go through the process and he'll get there when he gets there. But there's no question that there is a belief that his ceiling is very high. You watched the Blue Jackets in the playoffs last year, and you saw Alexander Texier make his NHL debut at the end of the regular season, score in the regular season, score in the playoffs. And then against Boston, it was very obvious that it was a man's game and that he was still a boy and there were uh, growing pains for him. There's no question about that. But in a little bit that you saw of him, uh, do you get the feeling that he can be an offensive presence in this league, maybe the same way that you're talking about Elvis. Once you get used to exactly what's going on around you, then you can flourish. Yeah, there's no question he's a talent, and people think very highly of him. Um, I think you said it right there. It's just a matter of how long he needs to make the adjustment. Uh, It's funny. I was at um, a practice uh, during the training camp for the Maple Leafs in their practice facility, and I was walking through the parking lot, and uh, driving and almost running me over was Josh Rimmer, who is your play-by-play guy, Jeff Rimmer's son. And I guess bad driving runs in the family because Josh couldn't keep the car straight. But he, like a true Rimmer, filled me with Columbus Blue Jackets propaganda, and he said, you watch Texier this year. That guy is going to be a player. He's going to make their team and he is going to make a difference. So I know you guys are high on him. At the beginning of the year, there's always a bunch of young players. People are high on him. And obviously, there's the, the guys with the pedigrees, the Jack Hughes, the, the Capo Cacos, the Kale McCars. And then there's sort of like the guys you think are going to be good players, but you don't know if they'll be good players right away, like Nick Suzuki in Montreal and Texier for you in Columbus. I think it's, it's a matter of you know when as opposed to if. But there's no question there's a lot of talent there and there's a lot of belief in his ability. Well, and another guy that we haven't seen except in the preseason who's coming over from Europe is Emil Bemstrom. And I know this management group is really high on him and what they think he can do. And they're especially excited about his prowess on the power play. And, Elliot, this power play in Columbus hasn't been good for the last couple of years, hasn't been consistent at the very least. How important is – How important has the power play become in today's game, the way that it's played and having a good man advantage? Well, I mean, it's critical. It is amazing when you consider the success that you guys have had considering your power play hasn't been great. And there was that one half of the one year. What was it, two years ago at the beginning when it was dynamite and it was killing everybody and then it kind of fell off the cliff? Um, You need it. There's no question about it. I mean, it's hard to score in this league because – You know, the fact is the teams are good. The scouting is outstanding. The coaching is better than ever. The players can watch games if they want to, and they kind of see everybody else. So you you have to take advantage of your opportunities when it comes there. And, you know, I I heard about a week ago uh, somebody who'd watched a couple of your preseason games thought that Columbus would give him the start of the year. They, They got the sense, you know, in the press box around your guys that you guys were excited about him, uh, that you you wanted to give him a taste if he earned it, which he clearly did. And I don't think it, it was not a huge surprise, at least to this one person I talked to, that he's going to start the year. I did really like you guys putting out that video. I, I thought it was 
Uh, it was really good. I mean, I felt bad for that kid. He's got, like, two of the best straight men in the world, Tortorella and uh, Yarmo, like, giving him the gears before they tell him he's made the team. And then uh, it, it was a great video. I really loved it. And uh, I'm not surprised he made it because, like I said, um, you know, there were some people who saw you guys play who kind of got a sense that your your brain trust at least wanted to give him a taste. And I don't know if you heard what John Tortorella said the next day after that, but he was uh, he was playing the nice guy. He said that Yarmo didn't need to be that mean to that kid. He should have he should have lightened up on him a little bit. It was pretty funny, but like to, to me, I, I'm a big believer the NHL needs to do more of that. There have been some some really good videos this week. I thought your video was really good. I don't know. I know that you know a lot of fans out there hate the Toronto Maple Leafs. But the video they put out last night after John Tavares was named the captain, where they put the little uh, jersey on his his baby boy who's only a few weeks old and with the C on it, and they presented it to him sort of as a way of telling Tavares that he was going to be his ca- the captain. I-, I think that kind of stuff is is what the NHL needs more of. If you're going to sell your game and you're going to grow the game. I know hockey is a conservative sport. It's the ultimate team sport. That's why I really love it. But you have to sort of sell the personalities. And those kinds of videos, I mean, I, I laughed my head off watching that, that Columbus one. I just thought it was so well done, and the personalities were so true to themselves. We, we as a sport, need more of that. And uh, I like that they did it that way, and I like the fact that Kekalainen was Kekalainen and Tortorella was Tortorella. Why be phony? Be who you are and – that's why they've reached the points where they have in their careers. Well, this is a good segue since you brought up the Leafs to talk about them because they're the Blue Jackets' opponent here for opening night at Nationwide Arena. I'm talking with Elliot Friedman from Rogers Sportsnet in Canada. He also has a 31 Thoughts column that he does and the 31 Thoughts podcast that he and Jeff Merrick put together and that they do, and they do so well. Um, you talk about John Tavares being the captain of the Leafs, and first of all, to continue upon what you were just saying, not just the video of of his son having the C on his sweater, but the way that the Leafs handled that. I, I don't know that the Leafs would have done that, uh, I don't know, maybe in the last five years. Five years ago, they might have had a big press conference. They might have uh, said who the captain was going to be, make him available for interviews about being the captain instead of the uh, instead of the show and the excitement that they built, the anticipation that they built all the way along up until – just before the opening game? I think it's tough to know when exactly it became their plan to do it that way. There's obviously been a lot of controversy here because of the situation with Austin Matthews in Arizona. I believe Tavares was going to be the captain anyway. I think they decided before the news got out about that uh, a week ago. But one thing I don't know the answer to, uh, but I suspect had to be changed, was how they were going to handle the announcement. And I think they decided just to change it and do it that way. Uh, I loved it. Um, you know, I, obviously Tavares, he's a really understated guy. He's all business, and it's not going to change anything he does. And that's why they picked it. He's all work ethic. He's lead by example as opposed to a big blabbermouth who tries to convince you that what I say is so important. Um but I, I loved it. I thought it was different. I thought there was a big buzz at the beginning of that game last night. Everybody was curious to see how they were going to do it. Uh, I don't really look at our ratings or the minute-by-minute breakdowns, but I would suspect for our game there was a huge number at the beginning to see how they would handle it. Uh, I loved it. I, like I said, I, we, we are in the entertainment business, and, and I believe you can take steps and be entertaining and do some things while still being a good team while still keeping a team concept. I realize there's always a bit of a delicate balance, but I think that hockey needs to move, and um, I like the fact they did it. And, I, I, and I'd like to see more different ideas of trying things. I think it's better for the fans. I think it's better for the sport. On your last podcast, did I hear you say that Kyle Dubas, the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs, is a wrestling fan? Yeah, it, that is true. Uh, Merrick said it. Um, I like to take credit for all the smart things and say that Merrick says all the dumb things. But uh, Merrick said it, and he was right uh, this time, and he's 100% true. Dubas Dubas is a big wrestling fan. I believe the WWE went through uh, Toronto in the summer, 
And he went and he got like his picture taken with uh, Ric Flair and they put it on the Leafs Twitter account. So, yeah, he does love his wrestling. There's no question about it. Well, nobody does a show better than them, in my opinion. As a matter of fact, the, once they start wrestling, it's not as fun for me. As my dad used to say, he always felt that wrestling was soap opera for men. That's true. Yes. Uh, I was a big wrestling fan when I was a teenager. Uh, not so much anymore, but I loved it. I loved the show. And uh, like I said, you know, we're in the entertainment business. We have to sell what we do as much as the league has to sell what it does. And anything that can make people smile or laugh or enjoy hockey a bit more, how's it a bad thing? John Tavares is just one of the big pieces there in Toronto. Austin Matthews, you talked about. Uh, Mitch Marner, he was in the news all summer until he got his contract. William Nylander, he was in the news all year last year until he got his contract. Um, but that team is built around the offense that those guys bring. But there are, when, you, when you look at the roster, though, it's, it's amazing how many different pieces there are, whether they came from the outside from another organization or whether they came up through the system. Uh, it's amazing how different the Leafs are, even with those big names that have stayed unchanged. It's, it's an organization that is trying some things a different way. You know, we, we mentioned, you mentioned a couple minutes ago the GM do this. Um, he really believes strongly that not only does he want to win, but he wants to win a certain way and that a skill game can win in the National Hockey League. Now, skill is very important. As the sport changes and, and the fighting leaves it, um, you definitely need a skill, more of a skill team than ever to win. But, you know, I, I do believe very strongly, and I think the Blues proved this last season, you have to be a tough team to win, tough mentally at least, tough to battle through and, and do things. And, you know, I, I think if you take a look at the way the Maple Leafs think and you take a look at the way the Blue Jackets think, I, I think they're very different. Not that the Blue Jackets don't believe in skill, but, you know, I, I think the Blue Jackets' identity is, yeah, we've got great players, really talented players, but we're going to grind you. You're going to have to fight for every inch of the ice against us, and you're going to have to earn every little centimeter you get out there. I think Toronto's wired a little differently. They're... Their feelings are, we're going to outskill you. We're going to get the puck, and you're not going to get it back. And if you make one slight mistake, you know, we're going to torture you. And if you – you talked about the power play earlier. Toronto has two power play units that are as good as a lot of other teams' first units. You, like, Ottawa tempted fate against them on Wednesday night. They kept on taking penalties, and eventually Toronto would just burn them. So I think – that's that's the way Toronto believes. It's going to be interesting, too, because essentially they're holding, I don't know if tryouts is the right word, but they're really rotating the bodies are in the depth of their lineup. For example, three of the guys who played in the opener on Ottawa against Ottawa won't play against you guys on Friday night. You will see Spezza, you will see Nick Patan, and you're going to see one of the defensemen, Justin Hole, who sat out the game uh, against the Sanders. So Toronto is also, not only is their philosoph uh, philosophy different than yours, but I, they're also going to be going through some extended tryouts for who gets those roles on a more permanent basis, and you'll see that on Friday night. Jason Spezza didn't start in the home opener, returning to his hometown. Uh, that's a big, I know it's a big controversy and a big, or I should say a big topic of discussion. It has been in Toronto. Um, but it's not the first time Mike Babcock has done something like that. Is it the big deal that people make it out to be? In Toronto, everything is a big deal. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, you go some places, I mean, you know Ohio State football. Everything with Ohio State football is a big deal. Everything with the Dallas Cowboys is a big deal. Everything with the New York Yankees is a big deal. And that's just what it is. When you work in Toronto and you step on the stage in Toronto and you put that jersey on or you work for that organization, that you understand it. You, you know the rules of the game that you're going into. Um, and that's just the way it is. And if you do well here, 
the rewards are enormous. Glenn Healy used to say when he played here that it was the only team he played on where the fourth line center had a car deal. And that's just the way it goes. You you accept it, you understand it. Now, I, I think it was a big deal because there was kind of – Babcock made it pretty clear early in the preseason that Spezza had to understand a role. So that story had kind of been building. And then the last preseason game at home against Detroit, when the Maple Leafs uh, said they were essentially playing their game one roster at the last minute. They didn't play uh, at the morning skate, I should say. They didn't. They suddenly said they weren't playing Spezza and they were playing Shore. And Babcock kind of threw cold water on it. Um, don't worry about it. And then that happened. So it was kind of building, but it's just the nature of the beast here. You you have to understand that. You know, Brian Burke had a great line last night about Babcock. He said that. He said that he felt that the coach was a little bit like Mike Keenan. He always liked something, some chaos going on around him. There, one of the off-season storylines here is: Do the coach and the GM see the same, see this game the same way? Is the coach on the hot seat? And I could see Mike Babcock being the kind of guy who's saying, "Well, if I am on the hot seat, I'm going to do this my way." So I think there's a little bit of that, but I think people were just surprised that Spets, a, a veteran. Uh, didn't get the game against his former team in the home opener. That's all. Elliot Friedman from uh, Sportsnet, Roger Sportsnet in Canada. See him on Hockey Night in Canada. Also, 31 Thoughts column, 31 Thoughts podcast. He does it with Jeff Merrick. I just want to ask you a couple of brief uh, league things. Eric Carlson does not play on opening night for the San Jose Sharks. Signed a big deal in the uh, summer. Uh, are we going to see him anytime soon? Do you know? Well, they said it was a personal reason, and the one thing I was told was don't assume anything. So I'm not going to. I'm going to play that one safe. Dustin Bufflin, what's going on there in Winnipeg? When does he come back and join the Jets? Uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think the, the word was that he wanted to retire, and the Jets told him to think about it. So I don't know when we're going to get a resolution to that one, to be perfectly honest. Um but I know the Jets were trying to convince him to play, and I've had people tell me that the odds were against it. But you never know. A guy sees the season start, maybe he misses it, maybe he changes his mind. But it didn't look great, at least when training camp opened. Justin Williams was such a big part of what the Carolina Hurricanes did last year. As their captain, as their leader, he established a lot of the, the fun things that they did with a very young team. Uh, right now... He's on the outside, not looking like he's coming in anytime soon. Do you see if that's a, a situation that could change, whether it be with Carolina or whether it be with somebody else? That one's a bit different than Bufflin. I, I think Bufflin was dealing with an injury issue that didn't heal, and that affected his decision. Justin Williams, and this is not a bad thing at all, I think he wants to try and be a dad. You know, he, he, As you know in this business, you – you have to skip the – you make a deal. You, you accept all the great things that come, uh, come with working in hockey, but one of the trade-offs you make is that you don't see your family as much. And, uh, you know, I, we, the, Christine Simpson during the playoffs last year from our place did a fantastic piece on Williams and his family, and I, I think he wants to spend more time with them. And, and maybe they'll get sick of him in a month like some of our families do, but uh, and he may change his mind, but – uh, being, you know, when when you can retire young and and be a dad and be a husband, that's a powerful lure. So uh, I think that's what we're kind of dealing with here. Is there any chance, in your opinion, that this could be another Mike Fisher kind of a story come late in the year, just before the trade deadline, get ready and play at the end of the regular season in the playoffs type thing? I do think Carolina will would be willing to do that. Yes. Um, the one thing that I, I really feel though is that. If you watch Nylander last year, he couldn't catch up. This game gets so fast, and I, I kind of wonder. Now, I do know that there were some players that said to me, if Buffalo or Williams comes back and they really kill it, then you can see more players taking the preseason off. But the Nylander thing last year, I know it scared people. He came back. Uh, you know, the second week of December, and he never caught up. He scored five goals, and the fans were all over him. And it affected him. Uh, it, it affected him, too. 
So I think the biggest question is how long can you sit out and still be effective? And we don't really have the answer to that question yet. And two other guys that have been mainstays in this league for a long time that are nowhere, Patrick Marlowe, Dion Phaneuf, any chance we see either one of those guys or both of those guys ever again? Well, Dion, I've reached out to speak to Dion, and he was polite. He just said, you know, I'd, I'd like to wait. So I think he's still processing. Marlo, I was under the impression that he was pretty confident that there was going to be a contract for him at the start of the year. Um, it obviously hasn't happened. I, I, I'd heard that Edmonton was interested, but I'm, I, I'm not sure that that was a situation for his family that worked. So I know there was some expectation that there would be something. So I, I'm not sure how that will go. Um, like I said, I, if enough asked for time, I'm, I'm going to leave him alone. Marlowe thought that there was going to be something. You know, we'll see how that develops over the next couple of weeks. Elliot, this is what makes you one of the greatest insiders in the National Hockey League. I really appreciate all the info, especially that Leafs info, which I need a lot of for tonight. But uh, thanks for taking the time with me. Always much appreciated, and hopefully we'll talk soon throughout the season. My pleasure, Bob. And by the way, I just want to say, like, I, 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 was, I sent a note to uh, Aaron Portsline. I thought that Yarmo story in the Athletic was dynamite. I, was a, I thought that was a great great story i i didn't know how much uh your gm liked potatoes it was i just thought it was a great look into a guy who uh really keeps himself private and uh it's one of the better stories i've read on someone i didn't know that well in the last little while and you're right he does keep himself very private and when you do get a little bit of a peek behind the curtain whether it's in a story or whether it's when you're talking to him in person uh, it really makes you feel like you're like you're getting something doesn't it Absolutely. It absolutely. It, it's nice to see, to know more about him and hear about him, for sure. That is Elliot Friedman from Rogers Sportsnet Hockey Night in Canada. He's got the 31 Thoughts column. He's got the 31 Thoughts podcast, and you can find him on Twitter at Fridge, H-N-I-C. That, of course, is for Hockey Night in Canada. Well, last night there were some Metropolitan Division teams that were in action. A couple of surprises last night, I think. Uh, first of all, you had the New York Rangers at Madison Square Garden. They beat the Winnipeg Jets. 6-4 to four was the final there. In Pittsburgh, the Penguins fall in their first game of the season. They were beaten by Buffalo 3-1. to one. I don't know if that's a good thing because the Blue Jackets go right in there tomorrow night to take on the Penguins, and they will obviously be hungry. And Carolina also played last night. They were at home. They won in a shootout, beating Montreal. The final score there was 4-3. to three. So today, the Blue Jackets get everything started at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Plaza party outside of Nationwide Arena. The players will come in and walk the blue carpet into the building. That will start around, I would say, 3.30, 4 o'clock. But if you get there at 3, you'll be there. You won't miss a thing. So the players will walk in on the blue carpet. Then, of course, make sure you're in your seats early, right? There's warm-ups, and then after warm-ups, make sure that you're set. There are two national anthems tonight. There is also going to be, uh, of course, the the opening video. That's always a big thing on opening night. The opening video, uh, the way the players are brought out onto the ice, all of those things. Opening night is special. There is a different air about opening night. So make sure that you are at Nationwide Arena tonight, that you enjoy it all. If you can come in the afternoon, come in the afternoon. Start in the afternoon and stay with us all night. Blue Jackets and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Game gets underway at 7 o'clock. Well, probably a little bit after with all the festivities. But anyway, game time is set for 7 o'clock. Our pregame coverage will begin on the Blue Jackets radio network at 6.30 tonight. We've got half-hour pregames. We're back to the half-hour pregames, baby. Dylan Tyre is your pregame host, and he'll start at 6.30 on the Fan 97.1 in Columbus, the flagship station of the Blue Jackets radio network, and our affiliates throughout the state. I know we're going to be on in Cincinnati tonight. We're going to be on in a lot of places because there is anticipation. And as I said, there are questions. And the first answers begin tonight. That'll do it for me, Bob McElligot, and CBJ and 30, presented by Telhio Credit Union. Enjoy opening night, the Blue Jackets and the Leafs. I'll talk to you then.